Section 1. You will hear a woman asking a shop assistant about DVD players. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 1 to 4. Hello, I'm interested in buying a DVD player. Can you help me, as I don't know very much about them? Of course. We sell quite a range. Actually, we're doing a customer survey at the moment, so I wonder if I could fill in this form about you and that will actually help me to advise you on the best DVD player for you. Oh, OK. <laughs> First of all, your occupation. Um, student. OK. Then, have you already got a DVD player? Uh, no, I've never had one before. Uh-huh. And how much do you think you want to spend on a player? Mm, I'm not sure, really. But I have got a budget. My friend said I should allow about £100. But I can't afford over £85, so that's what I'm working on. Mm-hmm. And... Do you watch DVDs very often? Um, depends what you mean by often. I don't know what the norm is. Is it about two a week? Uh, I suppose I watch three a month. That's enough for me. Yes. <laughs> what sort of films do you like watching then? Action movies? <laughs> Not really. Oh. My boyfriend always insists we watch science fiction movies, but... I prefer thrillers. Something to get your teeth into. OK. Just one more. Do you watch other DVDs, ones that are not films, like music or something? Not much, because I don't want to spend the money on something I can watch on TV, but I occasionally rent out comedy programmes and I fight with my boyfriend over all the sports DVDs he watches. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 5 to 10. OK, let me explain a bit to you about the DVD players that are in your price range. First, there's the DB30, which has only got basic features, but it is a bargain at £69. Now, all the DVDs come with an after-sales service that starts when the guarantee runs out. As it's so cheap, the DB30 comes with a limited after-sales service as it only includes parts. You would have to pay for most of the repair. Mm, mm, seems OK. Mm. Then a slight grade up from that is the XL643. This comes with an additional feature in that it has an extra button allowing you to record. That's quite useful. Oh, yes. That would mean spending less on DVDs to watch. Yes, so you'd make the extra money back on it that it costs. Mm. Let me see how much it is. Uh, ah, yes, that one's actually reduced at the moment from £79 to £71.99. Oh. I think it's worth the extra myself. And is that the same level of after-sales service as the other one? Well... You get a bit more for your money because what we're offering is a discount on labour. So you don't pay the full price if you have to call an engineer out. I see. Then the last one is this Tri-X24. It's a very good player and you can use it to listen to your CDs as well as watch DVDs. Mm, it looks nice, but I bet it's expensive. No, it's not top of the range. Let's see. Yes, it's £94. But what you have to remember is that that includes insurance, so you don't have to pay extra for that. And it comes with a guarantee that's valid for three years, as opposed to the usual one. What do you think? Hmm, maybe. Section 2. You will hear a salesman giving information to house owners about an alarm system. You now have 45 seconds to read questions 11 to 20. Thank you for inviting me to your residence meeting. My name is Martin Pugh from Safe Cell Alarms. 
I'm going to explain a little bit about home security, and I hope you'll all feel a bit better informed, and perhaps that you will even purchase one of the alarms we sell. It is all too easy these days for people to break into our homes. Did you know that 25% of all burglaries are committed by burglars breaking and entering via the back door? Even though it is locked, it is still relatively easy for someone to gain entry. And there are parts of our house that we think are not vulnerable because they look inaccessible. But they're not. So, if you're trying to protect your home, you should make sure the top floor is covered by that protection, not just the ground floor. We believe that the only way to secure your property is by having an alarm fitted. Just having the alarm on the outside can put burglars off. And we also recommend that you warn them about the alarm. To do this, we suggest you stick a sign in the front window of the house so it can be seen clearly. This alone should be enough to dissuade a burglar before they start. Now, our company has a range of alarms on offer, and I brought several along for you to see tonight. But let me just explain a few things about them. First of all, all of our alarms are highly visible. They're colored red, and on the underneath, there is a blue light, which you can see whether they are switched on or not. This acts as a deterrent to burglars who can see it as an active alarm system. Like most systems, our alarms are very sensitive, so you do need to look after them. You may be surprised to hear that a cat can often slink around unnoticed under the infrared beams, but a spider crawling across them will set them off. Also, our system is a little different from some. Most companies offer an option that connects their alarms to the police station. All our alarms have an automatic link to our company office. This means we can deal with the situation promptly and can sort out any alarms that have gone off by mistake. Okay, let me tell you about the installation of our alarms. Later on, I'll show you some house plans and diagrams of how the alarms operate, but you don't have to worry about them being intrusive as we normally put them in hallways rather than individual rooms. The diagrams show you how the beams work to cover the whole house in this way. Oh, one small thing while I remember is don't leave your security code in your house. A lot of people keep it in the kitchen or their study, but we suggest you leave it with a neighbor so that if there is a break-in, the burglars can switch the system off. Now, regarding the practical aspects of installation, I know that many of you are out all day, and I'm afraid we don't install the alarms at weekends. But we do offer a service where we can fit the alarm system in the evenings for you. But we do charge a little bit extra for that. Finally, we do offer a range of systems, so I suggest you look at the leaflets on our prices. And please don't be put off from investing in a more sophisticated system to protect your home as we do allow you to set up a monthly payment if it's too much in one go. Okay, now if you'd like to come forward... Section 3 you will hear two students, Jenna and Marco, discussing a business studies project they have to do. You now have 15 seconds to read questions 21 to 24. Come on, Marco. We've got to get on and sort out this project for Professor Buckley. Hang on. I want to make sure we've got all the information. Now, where are we? Well, today we need to sort out exactly what we're going to do and how we're going to divide the work up. Okay. How long have we got, by the way? Um, the end of term is April 6th and he said to hand it in on week 8, so... 
That's March 25th at the latest, because the beginning of that week is the 21st, mm. so not long. Right. Have you got the notes there? Yes. He wants us to do a fairly small-scale study, like the last one, on whether or not businesses were offering more benefits to staff. Mm. And we've now got to look at the rise in older workers. It should be fairly straightforward. Yeah, as long as we keep it small. Mm. Who's marking it? I don't know. Sometimes he gets the PhD students to mark it for him. Oh, actually, it just says here, a senior lecturer. Mm. I suppose it's too much for Professor Barclay to do them all. Yeah. Anyway, how are we going to go about this? Well... We have to decide how big we want it to be and who... Yeah, we... but I think we must sort out a timetable for the project. Otherwise, nothing will get done. OK. Uh, do you want to do that? All right. I'll do it as soon as we finish here. You now have 15 seconds to read questions 25 to 27. OK. What do we have to do now for the project? What's the best way to go about it? Um... Well, Professor Carter suggested we set up a focus group to get some in-depth interviews, but I think that'll take a lot of time. Yeah, I agree. If we did a focus group, we'd have to spend time deciding who to include in it, and it's not necessary to do one anyway. Oh, fine. And if you agree, I think we should get in touch with the businesses on the list Professor Carter gave us and ask them if they're prepared to participate. Sounds good. Uh, then we can go there, give them questionnaires and collect them later. Exactly. OK. Uh, then do we need to book one of those study rooms in the library so we can work together to input the data? Uh, perhaps not, as I guess just one of us could just sort it out, actually. Yes, that would be easier. A lot of what we're doing is qualitative, so it'll be writing up rather than statistics. No software for that, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it would look better if we had actual shots of some of the staff, because we're citing appearance as a factor in employability, aren't we? Yeah, OK. I'll factor that all in when I sort everything out tonight. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 28 to 30. I'm glad we decided to work together. I think it's going to work out well. Yes, well, given that we had to work in pairs on this project, I think we were right to choose each other. Hmm. We complement each other academically, as we're each good at what the other isn't. <laughs> in fact, we should have tried working together before. <laughs> yes. Now, how shall we split the work? I'll do the analysis, shall I? Oh, OK. It's just that it might be faster, because I'm used to doing it. Although your English is better than mine. I need more practice at reading, really. OK, I'll do the presentation then, if that's OK with you. Yeah, sure. I don't mind speaking in public, but I hate preparing all the notes for them. The thing is, the tutor said one person should do the whole presentation, and he said he expects me to do it because I haven't done one yet. No, that's fine. Now, let's see. Section 4. You will hear a media studies tutor giving a lecture about news sources. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 31 to 35. OK, now many of you will have heard about the predicted death of newspapers, as people increasingly access the TV and the Internet for their news. Today, I want to look at the USA, which has very advanced news sources, to see if this is actually true. In the USA, the main news sources without doubt are TV, the Internet, and the press. That is, traditional newspapers. And although they are each surviving and growing, they are also changing. Obviously, TV news has been around for a while, and the early evening bulletins when people get in from work are very popular. 
I suppose we traditionally think of the morning newspaper arriving on our doorstep with the daily news. Interestingly, this is not borne out by the statistics, which show that readership in the U.S. is much higher when people have time to relax, when they're not working, especially on Sundays. The Internet is also a popular weekend activity, but shows no variation with weekday access. So people are using the different sources in different ways. Interestingly, local radio has been hit less by the grip of quite strong local newspapers than by the Internet, which is seen to offer a better regional service. But just because the Internet is seen as the new force in news media does not mean it is dominant. Television has, of course, been global for a while. But now technological changes which have fueled the rise of online news have also allowed newspapers to print and distribute editions across the world. In fact, Internet news, which is seen as the big competitor for traditional markets, does not offer that much variety. Often, the sources are the online versions of the newspapers, whereas television, in order to offer something different, has had to come up with a much more mixed bag of reporting, from hard news to light reports on celebrity events. Another issue is reliability. The Internet is virtually unregulated, so anything can be reported there, whether true or not. Journalists on newspapers have fought a long, hard battle to fight intervention and to retain the freedom of the press. Television, however, is seen as critical to political power and has become subject to harsh controls about what it can or cannot say. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 36 to 40. Now, one very critical factor in keeping newspapers alive and well in the USA has been their approach to advertising. Obviously, newspapers are heavily dependent on advertising revenue, and they have become more and more imaginative in what they offer, in order to make sure that advertisers use them and not other news sources. This has meant that, contrary to popular belief, newspapers now have a significantly higher profit margin than the rest of American industry. So, how have they managed to raise advertising revenue in this way? Well, they have put a lot of effort into developing and maintaining a very strong association with the retail trade. And they've come up with a winner. A critical tool in their sales plan has been suggesting that the adverts they run can have vouchers. This has been enormously effective because they have found that not only do more people buy the paper to get the discounts, but also that this inevitably means much higher sales for the clients who advertised. As well as doing this, the newspapers have also introduced aggressive sales campaigns over the last few years. This has resulted in a significant and continuing rise in the number of advertisers prepared to pay the extra for full-page ads. So, what I would like to move on to...